So I have a special announcement for you today. For a limited time, you can get six months of Slate Plus for just $29. That's really good. That's 50% off. As a member, you'll get no ads on any of our podcasts, unlimited reading on the Slate site, and member-exclusive episodes and segments from our show and other shows like Slow Burn, Amicus, and Political Gab Fest. Slate's podcasts cover major news events from elections to social issues to historic court decisions. Our shows discuss what makes a song a smash. They analyze what's going viral and decode cultural mysteries. And if we've become a part of your listening routine, we ask that you support our work by joining Slate Plus. So sign up for Slate Plus now at slate.com slash money plus to access all Slate's content and support our work. Again, that's just $29 for six months through October 28th. So sign up now at slate.com slash money plus. Hello. Welcome to the Meet Me by the Fountain episode of Slate Money, your guide to what is normally the business and finance news of the week, but this week is the business and finance news of shopping malls. We are devoting this entire episode to shopping malls, which are the best subject. It's not just me, Felix Salmon of Axios, and Emily Peck of Axios. Hello, hello. And Elizabeth Spires. Hello. But we actually have an expert on. Alexandra Lang, welcome. Tell us about yourself. Who are you and what is this book that you have written? I am an architecture and design critic, and I have written a book about the history and the future of the shopping mall. It's a great book, and we are going to talk about that on this show. We're going to talk about the Gruen transfer. We're going to talk about entertainment. We're going to talk about whether malls are dead, whether online shopping has killed things. We're going to talk about the human need for proximity. And Felix will share a very special mall memory. Oh, yeah. you get After <laughs> after I do my standard, like, blasé Manhattanite, you know, I, live in a bubble. I, I rolling thing about, like, <laughs> I hate all the malls, I will actually, at the very end of this show, get dragged out of me the one lovely moment of shopping mall joy that I remember very fondly. It's all coming up on Slate Money. Slate Money is brought to you by Progressive. Are you thinking more about how to tighten up your budget these days? Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save over $700 on average, and customers can qualify for an average of six discounts when they sign up. A little off your rate each month goes a long way. Get a quote today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National annual average insurance savings by new customers surveyed who save with Progressive between June 2020 and May 2021. Potential savings will vary. Discounts vary and are not available in all states and situations. Hey there, Slate Money listeners. Before we start the show, I want to let you know about a story coming up a little later. It's from one of our sponsors, Charles Schwab. Schwab's passion for serving clients is inspired directly by the values of the people who work there. It's what sets them apart. Stick around to hear how Jim's approach as a Schwab financial consultant was shaped by values instilled by his father. Maybe you could start off by telling us sort of why you thought we needed to have a book about shopping malls, because I know for a long time they were kind of looked down at by the architectural community. Yeah, well, the first thing is the last big book on shopping malls was published in the 80s. It's called The Mauling of America, and it was actually pretty popular at the time, and it's a fun read. So I think anytime you're looking for a nonfiction book subject and you realize the last book was written 30 years ago, that's generally like a good place to be. But more than that, I just felt like after about 30 years things become historic. And that's when they become interesting. And a lot of the last great wave of mall building is about 30 years old now. And it seemed like it was time to take a closer look at this architecture, this experience, this place that was so meaningful to me as a child of the 80s. And I thought was meaningful to a lot of other people too. So one of the things I I really love about this is that you are an architecture critic. You think a lot about the architecture. And 
when most of us, myself included, think about architecture, the first thing we think about nearly always is what does a building look like from the outside? <laughs> and the the crenellations and the windows and the you know, the way it sits on the street and all of this stuff that just doesn't apply to shopping malls, the vast majority of which basically just look like a massive beige box from the outside. Yes. And the answer to why, which I'm sure was your follow-up question, is <laughs> that the developers of mall quickly found out that making the outsides of their boxes interesting did not pay. There was absolutely no financial reason to do an interesting outside. So they just slapped a big department store logo on the outside and they put all their money inside to the beautiful fountains and atriums and glass roofs and the rest of it that we know and love. That was actually one question that I had in the back of my head was, wasn't there a famous book by Robert and Venturi and Denise Scott Brown where they talk about decorated sheds and how like a bunch of like quite cheap but bright and pretty decoration on the outside of a beige box is like this deeply American thing that drives people in. Does that is does that not apply to shopping malls somehow? That does not apply to shopping malls. I mean, uh, <laughs> Venturi and Scott Brown designed a bunch of really amazing decorated sheds for Best Products Company, which was basically the target of its era. Um, one of my favorites had a big wallpaper pattern all across the outside. And oh. indeed, like you can decorate a box on the cheap. But that did not apply to malls in the sense that, like, it just was not necessary and nobody was really asking for it either. If you look at photographs of malls, what you actually see in the foreground is a lot of cars and the, the boxes really recede. So there isn't really so much of a moment where you're just looking at a mall in isolation without the cars as this purely architectural object. And if you are having that moment, you're quickly hustling inside and then you're seeing the good parts. So it's it's just a really different architectural experience than something that's on the street of a city or something that has to attract attention on a roadside, you know, like the original McDonald's or like Whataburgers, which are in those great A-frame shacks. The mall, you know, you're going to the mall. It has already attracted you. Maybe there is a large sign slightly closer to the highway, but it really doesn't need that curbside appeal. And weirdly, what you get is sort of faux architecture on the inside. Like I can kind of imagine a Whataburger, not an actual Whataburger, but some kind of a franchise on the inside or, you know, a restaurant with its own like roof, which doesn't protect you from anything because the wall it, mall itself has a roof, but they recreate smaller scale architecture within the larger scale architecture to sort of make you feel like a point of something you're familiar with, I guess. Yeah, well, the best design malls are really a container for all of these brands. So the mall architecture itself, even on the inside, tends to assert itself in the atrium and maybe a little bit in the food court. But the rest of it is meant to be a pretty bland container that then different brands can pop in and out of because, yeah, they're going to have their own mini architecture. And that's because, you know, the mall, in essence, is recreating a downtown street or a main street, which again has a kind of recessive basic architecture with glass show windows that you don't really pay attention to when there's something much you know brighter and more attractive in the windows or in the signage on the storefronts. One part of your book, you sort of go into detail on how the mall owners have a lot of say over each of those individual brand spaces, like telling stores what kind of flooring they can use and how the, their spaces can be designed and all that. Can you talk about how much control the mall owners have over like the look and feel of the stores in the mall? That part was a tour that I got with Nancy Nasher, the longtime you know, family owner of North Park in Dallas. And that is a very high end mall. And they have especially strict standards like they don't allow you to put a sandwich board outside your store. They don't allow your signage to overlap the architecture of the kind of entablature around the entrance to the boutique at all. But a lot of other malls are a little bit more laissez-faire about it. But indeed, 
the owner of a mall can say, you can't have, you know, plastic decorations outside your store. You can't put up Christmas decorations until one week after Thanksgiving. You can't have a sandwich board. You can't have, you know, half naked models standing outside and spraying people with perfume. All of this is within the purview of the lease agreement with the mall owners. And so different brands know going in kind of what they can get away with and what they cannot get away with. So that that kind of implies that you don't have perfectly aligned incentives between the store owners and the mall owners. The, you know, it, left to their own devices, the store owners who are presumably trying to maximize profits would do one thing and the mall owners who are also trying to maximize profits would do another thing. So where does that disconnect come from given that the mall owners, you know, ultimately make money when the store owners make money? Well, I think it's really ultimately about cacophony. And if you have every brand in your mall that has 200 stores doing the most, it's really going to be too much. Nobody's going to be able to see anything. So I think what the mall owners are trying to do is give each brand the space to showcase itself, but then not compete so much either, you know, visually, orally, in terms of sense, even with the stores that are adjacent to it. So it's really trying to achieve this balance where everyone can establish their own identity, but not be yelling over each other. Yeah, and that, you know, in the beginning of the book, you talk a lot about these early malls where they're all very innovative and, you know, there's a lot of design considerations that go into them. And the the owners seem to, and North Park is a good example of it, they seem to conceive of the mall as a kind of grand social experiment. So each of them are designed in very unique ways. The owners think a lot about how the mall approximates a public square and so on. My impression, of, as, a, as a, also a child of the 80s, is that at some point malls just became very cookie cutter. You know, they all kind of looked the same. They had similarly designed food court. What was the inflection point there? The inflection point is really in the 1990s where malls start to be bundled together into these real estate investment trusts. And you start having a lot fewer, you know, kind of owners of 10 malls in a geographical area, you know, owners of 20 malls across the Midwest. And you start to get a company like Simon, which now owns 100 malls all across the U.S. And they have a certain amount of kind of regularity that they want across their malls. They don't have the kind of fine grained understanding of exactly like what that community is and what it might want um, that those family oriented mall companies used to have. When you're talking about family oriented, it reminded me that I, I wanted to have you tell listeners a bit more about kind of the origins of the mall, how it's sort of the mall kind of grew hand in hand out of the suburbs in the United States and is really, in the early days, I think, developers were thinking of it as a place mostly for white housewives with with children, <laughs> right? Yes. I mean, can you talk more about that for listeners? Because I thought that was just really, I hadn't thought about it quite like that before. Yeah, and that was actually something that was kind of a revelation to me when I was doing my research. Like, I knew the history of the American suburbs, but I hadn't really thought about what role the mall played in the development of those suburbs. And so, you know, in the post-war era, you know, it's 1945, the soldiers are coming home from the war, um, the, the government is investing in a lot of big projects. And the two things they're mainly investing in is the building of the interstate highway system. And then they're also subsidizing mortgages. So a lot of the soldiers coming home, though primarily the white soldiers, could get low interest mortgages and buy new houses in the suburbs. So the mm -hmm. government is paying for the roads and the houses, but they aren't paying for a space in between those two things. They aren't paying for a communal space for people who, well, women and children who are at home during the day to come out of those houses and gather. And so that's where the mall comes in. And I think that's really the brilliance of Victor Gruen, the father of the shopping mall, who designed the first indoor shopping mall in Edina, Minnesota, Southdale, which opened in 1956. And he really saw it as this community space where mothers would come during the day with their children and eat at the so-called sidewalk cafe and play on the carousel and kind of, you know, be together. So 
we've mentioned Victor Gruen. We, we need to talk about the Gruen transfer, which yeah. is this, which is like the most American thing <laughs> in the world. There's nothing more American than the Gruen transfer. And not being an American, I don't, I'm not sure I entirely understand it, but explain it to me. Is it basically the idea that shopping stops becoming something you need to do and starts becoming like an entertainment thing? It's less about entertainment, though that that comes in later, actually, with John Jurdy and the 80s mall and, you know, putting a roller coaster in the middle. It's more about shopping, changing from being a task into a pleasure or you're at the mall and you have your list of errands, but you find that you've kind of forgotten about the list and you're just browsing. So it's that moment where your mind kind of takes <laughs> takes leave of your rational economic self and you're just wandering around the mall for the pleasure of it. Yeah, it's, you know, you go shopping for shoes, but you come home and you have a new shirt, a new hat, you've bought lunch and an ice cream or a big pretzel. You're looking at me like I meant to relate to you this. Know, <laughs> you know this, Felix, and but then you're like, wait, yeah. I forgot the shoes. <laughs> and it's even nicer when you're with a friend. I just think yeah. that's a really important part of this whole story is our human need for things to do with our friends and a place to do them in. The, the combination right. of kind of wandering and yes, getting some things done, but also chatting. That's just something we all want to do. And, you know, that's part of the reason I think that we will go back to the mall because I don't see humanity changing that much. Even and it's not, it's not just friends. I think this is one of the things that really struck me in, in your book. It's also strangers or, or neighbors that you don't necessarily know their names, but you might recognize their face if you've seen them often enough that in thousands of years of humanity, if you look at the way that cities developed, there was always some kind of zocalo, there was some kind of public square in the middle. And there was always a natural inclination of the inhabitants of those cities to gather in those squares, in those parks, in those public spaces, to see and be seen and to, you know, engage in the social animalness that we are. And that natural inclination had no natural outlet in the suburbs. There were no such squares in the suburbs. And the mall just perfectly filled that need, or maybe it didn't perfectly fill that need, but it was the capitalist answer to filling that need. It was a way to yeah. make money out of filling that need. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And I have to say that a lot of the other mall history books that I read um, in the first chapter, they would talk about the Agora in ancient Athens as being the template <laughs> for the mall. And honestly, that just kind of made me roll my eyes. Like, why do we always have to have like, this Greek <laughs> example to make ourselves feel better? So I didn't put that in my book. But what you just described is is basically that. So maybe I should have. But it's also important that Victor Gruen was a Viennese immigrant. He was Jewish. He, he fled the Nazis and came to New York in 1938. So his model was the charming sidewalk cafes of Vienna that he had grown up with. So this sort of more ancient model of the European small scale city that has a lot of street life. If only he would brought the Sachertorte with him at the same time, <laughs> America would be so much better. Support for this podcast comes from WISE, the universal account made for moving money around the world. 170 countries, 50 currencies, one account. Who exactly is WISE made for? It's made for Austrians uprooting to Australia, Swedes safariing in South Africa. It's made for business in Tokyo and pleasure in Miami. With WISE, you can send, spend, or receive money internationally all in one account. It's a convenient way to move your money across borders. You'll get the mid-market exchange rate with no markups and fees that are always low and transparent. Wise Business is the only business account you need to go global. It has everything you need to grow and operate your multi-currency business without the hefty admin and headache of a local bank. Join 13 million people and businesses who are already saving. Learn more about how the Wise account could work for you at wise.com slash slate money. Thanks to Avast for sporting Slate Money. Avast's new all-in-one solution, Avast One, helps you take control of your safety and privacy online through a range of features. Learn more about Avast One at avast.com. 
Avast empowers you with digital safety and privacy, no matter who you are, where you are, et cetera, et cetera. Avast's free version includes all the essential features, such as free antivirus, free VPN, and free firewall protection. The company's privacy features keep your identity and actions hidden. They also have something called Smart Scan, which finds and removes viruses and resolves the most common privacy and performance issues. I mean, it's good stuff. So, thanks to Avast for supporting Slate Money. Confidently take control of your online world with Avast One. It helps you stay safe from viruses, phishing attacks, ransomware, hacking attempts, and other cyber crimes. Learn more about Avast One at Avast.com. We were all talking about the book before we went on the podcast, and Felix mentioned that when he's heard you talk about the book before, uh, people just invariably launch into their own memories of malls when they were teenagers. And, and, you know, we're all Gen Xers, and so I think the mall was a very formative experience for us. And you have this really fun chapter in your book where you talk a lot about the pop culture significance of the mall and the, the sort of where the idea of the mall, you know, fits into the experiences of Gen Xers growing up because it was a place you went when you were a teenager. Yeah, and this is one of the great themes running through the book is the mall as a place for teens. Again, the teens had nowhere else to go, so they kind of adopted it as their own. And the mall owners have this fascinating relationship with the teens where they kind of want them to come in and spend, but they don't want them to be teens. Yeah, it was really fascinating to go back through a lot of those kind of movies that embody teen culture in the in the 90s and 2000s, Clueless being my favorite, and just take a closer look at the mall scenes and where in the mall those scenes are set and how the mall is being used. In, in the chapter on teens, I talk a lot about the atrium because that really is the place to see and be seen. And in fact, if you then look at the history of teen stars who did these mall tours, They were all doing their tours in the atrium. So it was kind of amping up what was already a teen pattern of clustering around the edges and watching people going up and down on the escalators and commenting on their outfits and that whole thing. And you see that played out in the teen movies. Um, I think it's really interesting. I was, you know, I really like the more recent teen movie to all the boys I've loved before. And that movie has no mall scene. And I just, it's sort of like, (laughs) why doesn't it have a mall scene? It's very, I feel like it's very Pinterest because all the design emphasis is on Lara Jean's bedroom. So it's definitely a sign of the times, but I feel like that movie is a little bit calling out for a mall scene. Yeah, well, then you wonder, I mean, malls don't seem as relevant now as they did when we were growing up, partly because you don't need to go anywhere now, right? You can just go on TikTok or Instagram. You can text or FaceTime your friend all day. You don't need to actually meet up at the mall. Yeah, the town square is online now if you're a teenager. I I'm, I, I don't agree, but I want to know what Alexandra <laughs> says. I've written a lot about teens and their online behavior, and I've talked to people who study it, and they say that teens are online, but often they're online and together at the same time. Like, they'll go to the mall and be sitting in the food court and be looking at TikToks together, or they'll be texting Mm. their friend that couldn't come out with them so that they're kind of part of the conversation. So that it's not necessarily a one or the other thing. I would also say that, you know, my niece and nephew are growing up in Durham, North Carolina, which is where I grew up. And my niece is 15 and pre-pandemic, she would go with her friends to the shops at South Point, which is the kind of fancy new mall that was did not exist when I was a kid and wander around in just the same way that I used to wander around South Square Mall, which it kind of cannibalized and replaced. So I think that there are definitely differences now, but I think that teens are still seeking, you know, in person hanging out. So I want to know. When you when you talk about the the fancy new mall cannibalizing the old <laughs> one, what what is it about the new mall that makes it fancier than the old one or more desirable? Or why would people go to that one rather than the one you grew up in? Well, it has a Nordstrom and it has a Williams Sonoma. <laughs> so first of all, it just has higher end stores. And the other thing was it was built, I think, in two thousand, and it is what's called a lifestyle center, which is. <laughs> 
actually partially indoor, partially outdoor mall, but basically it has an uncovered quote unquote street running down the center of it. And many of the stores open off that outdoor sort of pedestrian street rather than being under cover. And that's partially made possible by the fact that Durham is a pretty temperate location. There have always been a lot more of those types of outdoor malls in California and Arizona, for example. But that was definitely a mini trend in the early 2000s to replace what we're seeing as the kind of old elephantine enclosed malls with these indoor outdoor spaces. And they don't call them malls, right? You have I think no, they call them examples. lifestyle centers. Yeah, they're always trying to, <laughs> I mean, the, the powers that be of maldom are always trying to change the language. So it seems like they're providing something new. But I really think that the lifestyle centers are just an <laughs> indoor mall with the roof taken off and sometimes some kind of architectural nods to wherever it is. So, you know, in Connecticut, some of the outdoor stores will have a white painted pediment like it was the town hall in some colonial town. Or, you know, and I mean, this is kind of very <laughs> silly vestigial architectural features that kind of tell you where you are. I have this feeling that outlet malls are nearly always outdoors. Is that right? That is correct. And I actually d- decided not to talk about outlet malls in the book because they are quite a different business model and have a different story. Is there a reason they're all outdoors? It's less expensive. And I believe the individual brands own their individual outlet location. Oh, so that's the management a totally is different, different business yeah. model. No yeah. one owns them all. Yeah. I mean, I would want to check that because as that, I said, I'm not an outlet mall yeah. expert, but that is why <laughs> I didn't include those Another thing that someone else brought up is airport malls, which are actually organized by many of the same entities as off airport malls. But again, I felt like to talk about the rise of airport malls involved talking about a bunch of airport history. And that was just going to take me too far off the path. People like airports when they bring in a bunch of new (laughs) shiny retail you know like people like oh my god have you been to the new LaGuardia it's got like shops and and there's a water feature in the middle of it and doesn't that like in and of itself make it a better airport like it does somehow there's the the shopping improves the experience even if you don't go into any of the shops so the airports are now basically malls with a side business and air travel yeah I think that is, again, the grew and transfer at work, that suddenly you're not hating your layover in that airport as much because you have things to look at. And so we should, since we've mentioned the, the grew and transfer, you should mention as well what the, the Gendy transfer is. Jurdy. The Jurdy, Jurdy sorry. Yeah. The Jurdy transfer. The Jurdy transfer. So John Jurdy was a California architect who comes in the, in the 80s and is like, okay, this grew and model of shopping is kind of getting old and tired. We need to take it up about 25 notches. Um, Now the mall is not about shopping, but it's about entertainment. And I'm going to put an entire theme park in the middle of my mall. And (laughs) that mall is the Mall of America. (laughs) And that was then copied across. He then re- built that in various different forms in various different states with various different, like, very explicit entertainment options in it where people would go. The ostensible reason for going stopped being the shopping and started being the fun. Yeah, just the fun. And those, what I call very big malls, became tourist destinations in themselves. Like you could fly to the Minneapolis airport and stay at a hotel next to the Mall of America and spend your whole weekend at the Mall of America with your kids. Like that was considered a completely, you know, reasonable vacation in the 1990s and an exciting vacation because you were getting, you know, some of the thrills of Disney plus the different wings of the malls were themed to different other tourist destinations. So there was kind of a New Orleans wing and there was sort of a European (laughs) wing. So you were getting that also under one roof. So it was a whole thing. And actually, you know, I wrote this book mostly during the pandemic and I had a spring break trip to the Mall of America with my family planned for April 2020 that I had to cancel because I I wanted to I wanted to have that experience, even though I was a little bit nervous about the whole thing. (laughs) 
This message is brought to you by Discover. Did you know you could reduce the number of unwanted calls and emails with online privacy protection, the latest innovation from Discover? Discover will help regularly remove your personal info, like your name and address, from 10 popular people search websites that could sell your data. And they'll do it for free. Activate in the Discover app. See terms and learn more at discover.com slash online privacy protection. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and Charles Schwab. The people at Charles Schwab go the extra mile to help clients on their investment journey. It's part of who they are. Jim is a Schwab financial consultant. His dad was a contractor who prided himself on providing great work at a fair price. You know, I can remember installing windows with my dad and would have to go order the windows from the distributor. And um, we could have bought cheaper windows. He's like, no, I don't want to buy those if I put those in. Winter's going to come. They're going to be cold. My dad instilled in me, be proud of offering a good quality product at a fair price. Jim brings this integrity to how he serves his clients each and every day. I know from 20 years of doing this, that if you just help people and give them the guidance that they're looking for, it'll work out in the long run. They don't have to buy anything from you today. They don't have to pay you any money or commissions today. People are looking for good, honest, quality, intelligent service. I always put the people before the money, always. At Charles Schwab, they're not just financial people. They're people people too. With 24-7 support and one-on-one guidance from financial consultants, Schwab offers the tools to help you pursue your financial goals. Learn more about what sets Schwab apart at schwab.com slash why Schwab. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and Charles Schwab. Charles Schwab believes in breaking down the barriers to investing, making it accessible to all. Ray is a director of user experience. Her passion is making education accessible to all investors. Through digital design and experiences, Ray ensures Schwab's technology works seamlessly for clients so they can make informed decisions about their finances. I didn't know anything about investing. I didn't learn it in school. What is a stock? What is a mutual fund? What are futures? You know, all these different financial instruments And so every day I come in thinking about the real person who doesn't want to spend their time studying and becoming experts in this, yet they need to have enough knowledge to make sure they're protected and doing the right things. My expertise is always representing what our clients need, how to talk to them in a way that lets us meet them where they are and always advocating for doing the right thing for them. At Charles Schwab, they're not just financial people. They're people people, too. With free investing education and 24-7 support, Schwab offers the tools to help you pursue your financial goals. That's how Schwab makes investing accessible for all. Learn more about what sets Schwab apart at schwab.com slash why Schwab. I remember covering malls a little bit, like back after the financial crisis, and all the stories that got all the most page views online at the Wall Street Journal were like, malls are dying, malls are dead, look at this slideshow of dead malls. But but I don't <laughs> yes. think, ma- but malls aren't dead, no. but like that's, that's like what everyone thinks. So but you do have can, a wonderful chapter on slideshows of dead molds. Yeah. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. I, really, yeah. I had to, I had to grapple with that because that, that is what people still think. But you know, you were writing those stories in 2008 and now we're in 2022. <laughs> so that's actually a long time. Yeah. So, I mean, the number one thing I would say is that visuals are incredibly powerful. You know, like I, I'm a visual person. Like I write about visual and spatial things all the time. So those dead mall photographs went viral and people just assume that that meant all malls were dead from now forever going forward because the photos are in fact very beautiful. And as I write in the book, they, they, 
are part of this long tradition of ruin porn and our kind of attraction to these slightly scary, you know, slightly spooky places. So they fit into this established visual pattern. Many of them went viral. A lot of the dead mall photographers are very famous now and so on and so forth. But the truth is that, yes, many malls are dying for a variety of reasons, but there are also many malls that are still very popular and are minting money. Those tend to be the high-end malls, like basically malls with a Nordstrom or Neiman Marcus, which are among the few department store chains that are still doing well, and malls that have really kept up a good tenant mix that includes you know, higher-end destination stores and a lot of the designer brands. So what then happens to the need for a town square among lower income suburbanites? Well, in some cases, and I write about these, the the dead malls have been taken over by the population of newly diverse suburbs and have been turned into ethnocentric marketplaces that have become that town square. I talk about this one, Plaza Fiesta, outside Atlanta, that is basically a Latin American mall. It has a huge playground in the center. It has travel agents that help people fly to Latin and Central America. It has everything you would need for your quinceañera. It has great food. So like it's become that town square for the population that now occupies the suburbs around it, which are so far from you know the population that Victor Gruen was originally designing for. You know, the, the suburbs have changed so much since the 1950s and Another branch of the mall tree that's very successful are malls that have kind of grown with their suburb and and changed with the times. I was thinking about that chapter a lot recently because we've been talking a lot about office space now and how, you know, companies don't need as much office space as they used to. And it kind of feels like maybe that offices will go through a similar kind of transition where like the high quality spaces will remain and companies will still want those. But then the lower end office spaces will kind of become lower priced. And maybe they'll be, Felix was saying, you know, other companies will move into these office buildings or something. And I guess you don't have to worry so much about commercial real estate staying empty for long in the United States. Something comes along to fill it up. It depends where it is. In the suburbs, you need to worry. You need to worry. In New York City. In Manhattan, you don't need to worry. Okay, yeah. but I mean, it does. It sounds like what Alexandra is saying. You don't need to worry because the suburbs evolved to become more diverse, and the malls evolved along with them. Some died, but not all of them. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. There's definitely a parallel between dead suburban malls and dead suburban office parks. And I don't know if you all read Emily Badger's story in the New York Times yeah, a couple awesome. of weeks awesome. ago. Yeah, which was really good. Um, And actually, Emily and I are friends. And while she was working on the story, and I've written about corporate office space also in the past. So she sent me this really interesting piece of legislation that is in front of the New Jersey Assembly right now, which is basically lifting the single use zoning rules for dead malls and dead office parks and suburbs so that they can more easily be redeveloped as mixed use places. Mm. and. I thought it was it's it's really interesting to read because it talks explicitly about how these things become these kind of black holes that you know drag the community around them down and it starts to undo all of these decades of single use suburban zoning that's been really difficult and is part of why so many suburbs are still you know very hostile to pedestrians why they don't you know, have enough retail outside the mall in some cases. So I think it's really smart legislation and it explicitly connects those two kinds of suburban architecture as a problem and a problem with a similar solution. And and the solution, just to be clear, is to just jumble everything up and get not only the retail and the offices in the same place, but even have residential in there as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, As part of the diversification of the suburbs, one of the things that's part of that diversity is different types of family structures and also just increasing density. You know, these suburbs were built at a time when the idea was, you know, heterosexual couple and their two kids, but that's not how most people are living now. And so more different types of residential architecture is really important for the future of suburbs. And those mall parking lots are just crying out 
for new housing to be built on the blacktop, you know, closer to the edges so that there's actually a sense of quasi-urban pedestrian fabric, you know, the whole nine yards. There's so much that you can do with the amount of square footage that is embodied by a dead mall and its parking lots. I'm also thinking as you're talking, like, because of the pandemic, these formerly bedroom communities aren't that anymore. Like, people live in the suburbs in a way they didn't used to, right? There's fewer people commuting into the city every day, so, and there's more need for sort of mixed-use real estate. If more people are working from home, they're going to want to you know, go into town and get a coffee and maybe sit somewhere with their laptop or meet up with coworkers and stuff like that. So there's even greater maybe demand for mixed use kind of buildings and stuff. And also when you're working from home all day, you don't want to go to a mall that like takes a big chunk of time. It's a time investment to go to the mall. You can't just like zip in and out of the mall. Yeah. No, I think that's absolutely true. And even before the pandemic, some of the malls that were contending with the demise of the department store, which I think is a a true death, uh, were thinking about putting co-working spaces in some of the boxes that formerly (laughs) held department stores. And I, I actually think that, you know, could be a good idea. I think that even if people are working from home, A, sometimes they have to go out, they want to have coffee with someone, they want to have a business lunch in their suburb. But a lot of people don't have homes that are really sized for long-term work. And so they might want a desk somewhere that is walkable or is not that far from their house. And so like they, they might want an office park, but it's really like a lot of people co-working you know, in an office park. Yeah, you talk a little bit in the book about the difference between malls in other countries and malls here and then the evolution, how, how you know, sometimes the evolution of the mall has is, is diverged depending on where you are. What what are some of the more high-end evolutions that you've seen where you know, that are very different from what we have here? Well, I mean, the malls that people kept saying to me, like, why aren't you writing about <laughs> X were the malls in Asia, which I have only experienced a little bit. Most recently, I went to Seoul in 2019. But malls in Asia tend to be much more vertical. They are usually embedded in the city. They are usually served by public transportation. And that, I think, that kind of hyper-dense but also hyper-networked mall is much more where they need to go in the future as we try to, you know, kind of move the country away from the automobile or quite so much automobile dependence. And, you know, one thing that someone said to me who's lived in China for a long time is that the streets outside in China can be really cacophonous and really trafficy. So the mall is like, an easier version of the street. And people do use it to walk around and have better air quality and have that kind of ease, which is, I think, something that always called people to the mall and is something that mall walkers, for example, always talk about being part of the mall. Like, it's just easier than walking on the street. One of the things I remember from Stefan Al's book about super tall skyscrapers is that that kind of vertical mall where you have a subway station at the basement and then you have a bunch of levels of retail and then it becomes offices and then a hotel and then residential at the very top that kind of super big building like that is an amazing way at least in hong kong and i think in a few other cities of subsidizing the public transport system the hong kong metro makes a profit because it actually gets a bunch of that revenue from all of that subterranean space that used to be just like dirt and is now super valuable retail yeah and basically transit oriented malls and adjacent development is also the business model for mall development in Chile and in the Philippines, which actually has some of the largest malls in the world. So that's definitely, you know, something that people are very successfully doing elsewhere. And I think one of the things I say in the book about Seoul is it felt like everywhere was on top of a mall. Like anytime I exited the subway system, there was at least a single story of like really cool bookstores and coffee shops before I went upstairs and I was in an office building or I was in a museum or something else. And it was just very natural. And I mean, there are a few places in New York that have those kind of underground concourses, but they tend 
not to be the nicest stores, or I guess there was that one bar that people used to, to like in the subway. <laughs> on, 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 um, on 50th Street? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Siberia. I never went there. But I felt like in Seoul, it was just a matter of course, and the options there were, you know, very cool and very up to date, and I wanted to check them out. And so it was just this very natural layering of a different kind of retail into the city that then was very convenient when you went up top and went about your business. I mean, I think you can see that a little bit in the popularity of the ongoing popularity of the winter garden and then um, the sort of food court at Brookfield place that like, a lot of magazine editors have their offices upstairs um, go to for lunch. And I've yeah, gone to when Condé Nast moves yeah. in next door, you know, it's going to be cool. Yeah. Is that right. near the Winter Garden? Yeah, the one next It's right off of it. But you see how, like, that is so much more popular than the mall that's in the Oculus, which is a terribly designed mall and just, like, has none of the good and mall has no qualities food. and all of the bad mall qualities. Yeah. Because people, if there's no food, no one's interested. So I just want to finish by by asking, like, if this is the case and and – the vertical mall with the subway station in the ground and the retail above that and then the hotels and the residential and everything in the same place. If this is the vision of the future, then how is it that absolutely everyone, yourself included, hates Hudson Yards so much? What, should you tell listeners what Hudson Yards is? Yeah, tell us what Hudson Yards is and let's tell us how terrible it is. So Hudson Yards is the mall and mixed use high end retail development that opened in 2018 on the west side of Manhattan. And today it's often best known for the terrible Thomas Heatherwick sculpture, the vessel that is now closed because it turns out to be a suicide magnet. So the problem with Hudson Yards is it is terribly designed. I mean, it's terribly designed. The most fun part of it is Mercado Little Spain, which is the high-end food court developed by Jose Andres, which is stuck underneath the mall so that you have to go to it through a completely different entrance and you can also completely avoid the rest of the mall. So none of the kind of design and conviviality of that space bleeds into the mall. And then when you go into Hudson Yards, there is no central atrium. There is no fountain. There's nowhere to meet. There's just this stacked vertical space that's designed in a very kind of mundane luxury way that is confusing to navigate. And you never feel like you're there's a there there. You never feel like you've gotten to the good part. I, th I think you mentioned in the book that you been there like half a dozen times and you got lost every time <laughs> yes and i'm i mean so many people have said oh i find malls con so confusing and i'm like really i don't find malls confusing at all but i find hudson yards confusing and you know i got a tour with one of the related execs and he explained it all to me <laughs> and i was just like i don't believe you like you're telling me something that I am personally just not experiencing at all. <laughs> what was what was his logic? He says that each floor ha is kind of for a different demographic slash income level, and you just kind of keep wrapping around on what? the escalators. <laughs> and <laughs> yes, wait, what? And it's, it's, it's like the JG Ballard book High Rise, where yeah. depending on how much money you have, you're on a different floor. Yeah, like an apocalyptic train where yeah. each car is like Tilda Swinton. Yeah, versus. exactly. I mean that that. Is actually true about other malls. Like at, at North Park, North Park is kind of a, a square donut. So, and Neiman Marcus is in one corner of that square. And all of the luxury brand stores are right outside Neiman Marcus. So, if you're a really rich person, you only need to go to Neiman Marcus and mm -hmm. Luxury Row. I mean, you know, they have like Dolce and Gabbana and Tiffany there, like the highest end brands. If we talk. And at Hudson Yards, that's all on the first floor. Sorry, I haven't been there in a while. That's all on the first floor. So if you're a luxury shopper, you only have to go to the first floor. And then it's like one level up, you get like the Zara's and the Aritzia's and things like that. And then one level up from that, there are cheaper things. And then one level up from that, there's actually food, but you can't see the food from the bottom. And there's no sort of communal eating space up there. And that's also where they stuck their Neiman Marcus, which didn't do very well because, again, it, it had no presence. So 
there were a lot of like highly paid retail experts who put their two cents into that mall. But I just do not personally feel it makes a lick of sense. And well, it's not just you personally. It. Yeah, it's like yeah. literally everyone yeah, agrees yeah. with you. They just did a very bad job. <laughs> but this is kind of reassuring to me in a weird way that, you know, we still don't know and that so much about malls and shopping and human behavior that it is possible to spend $40 billion on something as enormous as Hudson Yards or whatever the total budget was and just get it completely wrong. Like there is, there is an ability to, this is not settled science. Like there, there is this idea, I think, sort of running through the book The you know, Victor Gruen kind of like found the formula and then people, you know, expanded on the formula but the formula is known and i think this is proof that the formula is not is not quite as deeply understood as as you might think given that it's possible to fuck it up so spectacularly right i think there's economics and science and studies of human behavior but with all retail and all brands like there is some kind of ineffable like cultural quality like does this feel good that you have to make happen, and sometimes it does not happen. But if it does happen, it happens in North Dallas, right? That's the, the spiritual home <laughs> of the great really, shopping mall. Yeah, I really love North Park, and I, I now I've studied it a lot, but I remember the first time someone told me, oh, you have to see this mall, and I walked in, and I was like, oh, my God, like, what is this place? Like, I just had a completely authentic joy reaction and everyone i know who's been there has had the same reaction so it is a legitimately a beautiful place and a beautiful shopping experience elizabeth have you ever felt authentic joy into walking into a shopping mall that wasn't one you <laughs> yeah. grew up in how about you emily <laughs> Yeah, when I was growing up, we would go to different malls and it would be exciting because one mall we'd go to would be really nice somehow. It'd have a fancier department store or something and you'd be like, well, this is a nice mall. And I don't kind of remember the design yeah, elements that I made think me feel that That, that way, happened but. to me once when I moved to Palo Alto as a teenager and we walked into the Stanford Shopping oh. Center for the first time. And you like that was amazing. Like I didn't realize how old that was. That was very, very early on, right? Yeah, Stanford Shopping Center is a great example. That's kind of the template for those lifestyle centers that I was talking about earlier. And it is really beautiful. I also love the Stanford Shopping Center. So there you have it. There you go, Felix. You have a mall memory you shared with us. <laughs> oh, my God. We used to go to Gaylord's Indian Restaurant in the Stanford Shopping Center, and it was it was my favorite thing in the world. I got you in the end. <laughs> <laughs> Alexandra, thank you for getting me in the end. I, I, I have come around to your way of thinking. Thanks for re writing this book, which is fantastic. Meet me by the fountain. And, yeah, thanks for coming on Slate Money. Thank you for having me. This message is brought to you by Discover. Did you know you could reduce the number of unwanted calls and emails with online privacy protection, the latest innovation from Discover? Discover will help regularly remove your personal info, like your name and address, from 10 popular people search websites that could sell your data. And they'll do it for free. Activate in the Discover app. See terms and learn more at discover.com slash online privacy protection.